Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Just getting this kicked off. Welcome to our uh, first of a few uh, fall seminar uh, fall seminars for the Research Data Stewardship Initiative at the University of Michigan. Um, we're very happy that you have joined us today. Um, just as a as a brief intro, the Research Data Stewardship Initiative at U of M helps researchers improve the the transparency, rigor, and impact of their research and scholarship across all disciplines by providing resources and guidance around data management and data stewardship. Um, we're thrilled to have you here today for our for our seminar series, and we have two wonderful speakers joining us today. Um, we have Arthur Lupia and Laura Scott. Um, first, we'll have Arthur or Skip Lupia present, um, and then we'll do a short Q&A after his presentation, and then we'll move to Laura and do the same. Um, and if we have time, we'll kind of open it up for, for questions from everyone. Um, this is set up as a Zoom webinar, which means we can't see everyone here who's joined. But if you have a question that you'd like to ask after the speaker is finished, um, if you use the raise hand feature, we can then go and unmute you so that you can ask your question. There's also the Q&A um, function that's that's available too. So please feel free to, to use either of those, whichever you're comfortable with, and we'll make sure that um, we can get to your questions um, with time permitting. So let's just jump right in. And the first speaker is Arthur Skip Lupia, who's the Gerald R. Ford Distinguished University Professor of Political Science in LSA and a research professor in ISR. His research, his research examines how people make decisions when they lack information and in how they manage complex information flows. From 2018 to 2022, he served as assistant director of the National Science Foundation, leading its social, behavioral, and economic sciences division or directorate. Uh, while he was at NSF, he also co-chaired the government-wide subcommittee on open science for the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, he's currently a member of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Strategic Council for Research Excellence, Integrity, and Trust. Um, he's a recipient of University of Michigan's President's Award for Public Impact, and he recently began an appointment in the Office of the Vice President for Research as Executive Director of Bold Challenges. So, Skip, I am going to hand this over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you. Um, may I have permission to share my screen? And it's great to see everyone. Um, what I want to talk today about is, is opportunities, uh, both for you and for science generally that are associated with uh, open science. Um, can I get a screen sharing uh, permission, please? I'm just realizing I have to stop sharing mine. That's probably what's happening. Okay. okay. Let's Thanks, see. All right. Here we go. Uh, all right. So um, first, I want to thank Nick and OVPR for, for putting this series together. Um, and I want to I want to thank you. I guess the first thing I want to do is discuss uh, gratitude. Um, it's really important, I think, in science as we think about not just advancing inquiry, but about serving communities, you know, in our state, nation and world to just appreciate the opportunity we have every day uh, to work with amazing people from all different walks of life. Um, I think it's important to just take time to appreciate uh, the folks we work with, because everybody takes risks to, to be in this field. They make sacrifices with respect to personal life and family, and, and a lot of times they put a, strong, a, a brave face in front of it. But as we think about how to work together more effectively, how to serve the world more effectively, I just think it's important to appreciate the folks around you. And, and that's something I think a lot about uh, when we're putting together open science policy. So I'm going to talk about... Um, the origins of some of these policies, and I'll end with a discussion of what the White House has recently done. So together, uh, folks in research can improve quality of life for individuals and communities uh, at the levels of states uh, or, or nations. Um, and what we can do can inform, you know, farms and factories and, and folks will never step foot on a university, uh, but it can help some people overcome existential crises and other, you know, innovate their dreams for tomorrow. And so it's an amazing thing that, that all of us get to do uh, on a daily basis. Um, let's see, there we go. Um, collectively, what we do is, is try to produce rigorous, and by rigor, I mean you know, producing research where we can explain why we're claiming what we claim, 
and precise, meaning it, it, it fits whatever context we're talking about, with the idea that we're empowering people and improving quality of life. So it's this incredible opportunity that we have on a daily basis, but there are some challenges. And a lot of challenges have to do with data and incentives. So today, many researchers have an inability to access types of data that could help them produce really valuable research. And so, so a question is, how do we make data more available? At the same time, there's another challenge with, with a different energy, but it's also related to the availability of data. And that challenge is uh, researchers have strong claims to make uh, strong incentives to make claims that attract attention. That's how you get in journals. But if you want to be in the newspaper on social media, you can also do things to attract attention. And those incentives are often strong relative to the incentives we have to explain and document how discoveries emerged. And so you've heard of things like publication bias and p-hacking. And while these are problematic for academic communities, they can be more problematic for the people who we try to serve. One manifestation of just how badly things can go uh, is, is, is when you think about uh, the relationship between the things that we hold dear and the outputs that we produce. So most of us are part of an academic uh, advancement ecosystem. And in that ecosystem, there's some things we really focus on on a daily basis. You know, uh, you know are we getting paid? Do we have health insurance? And there are so many other things uh, that are part of advancing in academia. And the, this part of, of being in research, it can be like, you know, you're playing, you're playing a game, right? You're in a game show and it's like, hey, how do I win the next prize? And so these are the types of things that left unchecked uh, can produce a publication bias, p-hacking and so forth. And again, those outcomes are not just academic concerns. They're really consequential. This is a book called Rigor Mortis by Richard Harris, who's at NPR. And it's this detailed and tragic account of how research practices that have led to um, null results being suppressed uh, have caused have uh, have, have caused lots of problems in the developments of, of vaccines and medications. The basic idea being if you only publish positive results and then people try and bring to market a vaccine or, or some sort of procedure to save lives, uh, you bring it out to the field that doesn't work. And the, the initial reaction is, well, we must be implementing it wrong because all the data said that this would work. And then you look back and find out, well, the only things that got published were the positive results and, and this was knowable. So, so these are challenges that lead people, you know, particularly in Congress where, where, where I spent uh, some time at, at NSF, people ask, well, well, why should we pay for all the science when we're not sure we can believe it? And why should we trust uh, scientists? And so we have two challenges now. We have one that data is not available for us to make progress. And another is we have some questions about the integrity of science that maybe greater availability of data uh, could, could help us deal with. So, so that's the question. Can, can we do better? And again, I, I love us. I think what we're doing is great. But as a, as a whole ecosystem, uh, can we do better? And the question here isn't about how do we work more? How do we ask people to do more things? It's, it's how do we work differently? So um, a, a, a grounding point for me is Richard Feynman, who, who I actually am old enough to have met. Um, I was not president at, present at his commencement address. I think in 1974, I was reading Spider-Man comic books. But at the 1974 uh, commencement address, he talked about scientific integrity and what its origins were. And, and he, 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 re he really focused on the idea of utter honesty. And what that meant later in his address is giving people as much information as possible to assess the claims you're making. Because every scientific claim comes from a process where you uh, collect data and you categorize what you see and you analyze what you categorize and then you interpret what you analyze. And every claim you make is, is part of both phenomena you're studying and that process. And Feynman was really stressing the importance of making all of that available so that when someone reads a scientific claim, they can understand more about what it means. And in key cases, like the ones that Richard Harris was talking about, does this literature help me do something that I'm trying to do, right? So it's about giving all of the information, making as much of it available as possible, not just the information that leads in a particular direction. So as we think about how to improve the integrity of science, there is a game plan, right? And the, the game plan is by increasing access to information about every step of the scientific process. So on the screen here, you can, you can think about how we 
how we um, share information, share data and code books and things of that nature. But how do we choose what to observe? So we're going to look at a certain type of specimen. Uh, how do we choose uh, which particular spe specimen to look at? How do you record what you observed? In some cases, it's straightforward, but in other cases, how you take an object with 17 characteristics and decide which three to record and then analyze uh, could be consequential. You think about um, how analysis occurs, how, to in how interpretations occur, and then I think a critical part of science is always asking yourself, how could I be wrong? So, so greater availability of data, greater open science practices, those that, that also emphasize reproducibility, uh, and transparency uh, can help increase the public value of science by helping people better understand what it's about. So, so this is a little flyover on the importance of open science opportunities for uh, integrity. But then there's the question of access. And so what I want to close uh, in talking about is, is some moves that the White House has recently made. Uh, so as Nick mentioned, I was uh, co-chair of the Subcommittee on Open Science. And what that activity was about was really bringing together all the federal agencies to think about how they could better, more effectively, and more securely share data with one another and the public, including researchers. And it turns out that's a tall task. Uh, there are lots of different types of data. There are certain privacy sensitivities associated with some data, national security with others. And so the question is, how do you do this? And uh, after a lot of work and a lot of like incredible dedication, the White House uh, just a, a few weeks ago released a new set of policies that every federal agency has to follow. And these policies have to do with uh, sharing information. So uh, you can look at the document, if you, if you type words like this into Google, ensuring free, immediate, and equitable access to federally funded uh, research, what you will find is that every federal agency by the end of 2025 must, uh, must uh, make available any publication and any supporting data from any US government funded research available to the public at no cost and with no embargo. So what a publication means is anything in a journal, but also in some fields, uh, conference papers uh, are peer reviewed and have the same effect. So any, anything in that category. What supporting data means is not necessarily an entire data set, but let's say you and I write a paper together and there's a set of claims in it. The requirement is that we make enough of the data available that someone could go through and replicate our claims. You know, particularly if they had our code, they could press a button and see whether they can reproduce it or not. Uh, the at no cost means that it has to be available on a public website. For NIH, that means putting it in PubMed Central. For NSF, it means putting it in their public access repository. It can be in other places too. And the no embargo is the big move. Uh, right now, federal agencies, NSF and NIH in particular, uh, have a rule where publications that come from their research have to be put in public, but, but a year, at, you have a year, uh, there's a year embargo where it doesn't have to be made public. This new policy gets rid of the embargo and makes the, the research and the data available on the date of publication. There are also uh, a number of practices to ensure integrity in public access uh, policies. And those are types of infrastructure and policies that advance the types of behaviors we talked about before, uh, making available information about how a scientific cl uh, um, claim was made. And then also uh, the, the, the memo describes a number of policies to ensure equitable delivery. Because when you think about closed science, where you think about where data and publications are not available, the folks that usually have the worst time getting it are the folks that are that are already suffering inequalities in lots of other ways. So, so much of what the, the new policy is focused on is not just making data available, but trying to make sure as much as possible that it's accessible to everyone. I'll give you a couple of details about, about how they're doing this. First, um, to make the data more accessible, uh, every grant that every every time you apply for a grant for from a US agency, you'll have to submit a data management plan and a public access plan. Now, NSF already has this requirement, and NIH is implementing a new version. But the basic idea is when you, when you ask for money, you have to talk about if data is produced, where is it going to be stored, and how is it going to be accessible, right? And that's part of how you're evaluated. So it really asks people to think from the beginning about how they're going to take care of the data and make it available. Uh, second, um, the government is not interested in having a big data warehouse, because if you're thinking a, a lot about all the data that's collected in all the disciplines, 
Uh, it just, you know, how you would manage that with all the different types of data is impossible. So instead, what agencies are going to be required to do is offer guidance to anyone who gets funding from them about desirable characteristics for a repository. Now, if you're at the University of Michigan, you may know that we have world leading data repositories here, including the uh, ICPSR uh, repositories. The, uh, there's this notion of you not only want it to be secure, but if there's a power failure or a, bu a computer, uh, a building was destroyed where there was a server, um, you have things called trusted digital repositories that have backup systems. You know, So these are repositories that store data in one site, but have backups in other sites in case there are failures. So these are amongst the desirable characteristics of repositories, and all agencies will be required, required to offer guidance to help researchers um, accomplish the, the public access plans and the data management. Finally, um, there, every, everybody that enters the system will be required to have a digital object identifier. There'll, there'll be a code, uh, a number that's connected to you, that's connected to your work, any patents that you have, many data sets, so that the US government and others can build out systems where if they find a, a particular result or data set, they can easily find the people associated with it and other, thing that they, other things that they did and so forth. Uh, FAIR, uh, FAIR is a standard that we think of as findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And it's just a way to think about how making data more, uh, more valuable and more accessible to more people. When we uh, think about open science policies in these ways, when we think about how to be more transparent about our procedures, and when we find ways to make materials more accessible, you know, it just empowers all of us, all of us who've decided to take the risks and make the sacrifices that are engaged with research. It opens up opportunities to create more value for more people every day, to really attack the problems that, that, that challenge so many people in the world and to create results that are reliable. So while some of the things I've talked about may seem technical and arcane, at the end of the day, people's lives depend on them. Our ability to advance our understanding in key fields depends on getting this stuff right. What I've talked about today can't be the thing you do after the important stuff. It has to be integrated into the main workflow. So every day provides all of us, we're all so fortunate to have an opportunity to be at the University of Michigan and to do research, work with one another, appreciate one another and serve one another uh, you know, in important ways. These open science opportunities and other like, others like them give us new ways uh, to be more effective. So uh, let's seize those. And again, uh, I want to thank you for all you're doing for the university and go blue. Thank you, Skip. All right. If you can, no, you got it. Um, wonderful. Thank you for that talk. That's um, I, I think I could fill up uh, a couple hours worth of follow up questions. Um, but I, I know we have a couple that have started to come in from the Q&A, so I might go to um, get those addressed first. And as a reminder, you can also use the raise hand feature if you want to ask your question live. Um, just feel free to, to put that up there and we'll, we'll get you called on quickly. Um, one is uh, a question about sort of the journal side of this. And I know you've probably had to consider the, the, their perspectives. Um, as this as the sort of memo was being developed for what I think was has been over the last several years, even though it just came out this this last month or two. Um, so the question is, what do paywall journals think of making papers public? And I guess maybe a general comment on from your perspective, how do you see this affecting the, the publishing uh, ecosystem? Yeah, so that's a great question and something we all had to deal with. As Nick mentioned, uh, this this policy has been more or less uh, complete. There's been a structure for it for several years, but working with folks like publishers has been a big part of moving it forward. There are different types of publishers. So um, there are large uh, academic conglomerates that, that publish thousands of journals. And you know they are on the one hand, not happy about possibly losing the revenues that come with exclusive access to certain types of articles. On the other hand, this is a worldwide movement to really open up research articles, and the larger organizations have found ways to pivot. They're not uncontroversial, but they, they, they have found ways to do it. So some are moving really to open access practices where they charge authors or institutions uh, to publish articles. Springer Nature, for example, I think Nature is going to have a, a 10,000 euro author submission fee 
uh, that would then allow an article to be open access. So on the one hand, you get the access right away and Springer Nature is making some money. On the other hand, if you don't have 10,000 euros to publish a paper in science, uh, there's some inequities introduced there. So, so there are lots of ways that, that some publishers are trying to figure this out. The folks that seem to have a, a bigger struggle are the ones that can't pivot in that way. And those are journals that are associated with academic, uh, academic organizations. And sometimes they do a lot of the production in house. And for them, the thought of losing that revenue can become existential. So we actually had a lot of conversations, did a lot of listening with uh, how professional organizations create value for members and how in this new environment, they can find ways to kind of bundle products and services to provide maybe more uh, value to members than they had before, but without tying it to basically excluding folks from certain types of knowledge. So, you know, was anybody doing a happy dance when, when we rolled this out the first time? I'm not sure they were, but there have been a lot of really great conversations about how to achieve some of the goals of openness and equity at the same time that you allow a large set of really innovative organizations to remain financially viable. That's great perspective. Thank you. Um, another question gets a little bit at the tension of the fact that there are a lot of data sets that have special needs or special security requirements, um, privacy concerns. And this question in particular is asking about um, you know, HIPAA and things that large machine learning data sets like radiographs or patient treatment history. Um, how do we justify the, the need to protect a lot of data? with the call to make everything sort of publicly available? Yeah, that's a really good question. And again, I'll talk about uh, things that are happening in government. There are two parallel conversations relevant to that. One is the open science question. The other is you may remember in 2018, something called the Evidence Act was passed. And the Evidence Act actually requires government, the US government to develop a national secure data service where every agency by default is required to put their data in there and have it available to other agencies. But of course, there are all kinds of complications associated with that. So what is informing both the open science policies and the build of a national secure data service is trying to think through these trade-offs. Right? So the national secure data service, what they're actually gonna do is, is build more like a hotel lobby. They're not gonna build a warehouse. So they're gonna try to solve the problem this way. And so an agency can say, First, an agency can write, here's a bunch of data that is off limits under any circumstance, and here's our justification. They can forward that, and, and uh, there's a process for which that can be approved. So there's certain data that will never see the light of day. But the interesting thing here is there's data that if it could be used in a secure way, or if certain elements of the data could be preserved while privacy uh, threatening uh, elements are somehow hidden or, met or masked or mixed or something like that. Uh, so a lot of the build of both of these cases is can you, are there techniques you can use like differential privacy or zero knowledge proofs? And I can explain what they mean if you want. But there are technical ways that you can allow certain types of access to data, retaining a lot of the analytic power while preserving the privacy. You got to worry about these things being hacked. But there, I guess the answer to your question is um, really uh, private. You know, really threatening data will never be released. Uh, there's some data that can be released without a threat. And there's this middle category where people are thinking very seriously about it. And there are a range of technical solutions that are pretty exciting. Yeah, that, that's one uh, issue that I, that I hear come up again and again is sort of the, the balance between this release everything and protect some things. So there was, we just got a follow-up question about that too. Um, and I think your answer could apply to things like export controlled data or controlled unclassified information, just as much as it does um, protected health information. So I'm, Skip, I might ask one last question and then we'll move to Laura. Um, and this, this, you know, I think you laid out a nice vision for, for why the government or why science or research in general sort of should feel compelled to you know, treat data as an asset and, and, and it adds significant value to our scholarship, public value to our scholarship, whether it's improving our reproducibility or rigor or public trust. But I think a lot of folks will see this as an additional burden to add to how they do research. Um, it's another box to check, or it's one more thing they have to train their students to do, or you know, one more system they have to learn. And so I'm curious about sort of from your vantage point, how the government was sort of treating, approaching that problem and 
is you know do we, is there a new way to think about this is is there is that the wrong way what do you think oh, nick that's that's totally a, the right question and one of the reasons that in the memo that i referenced they're actually giving three and a half years to figure out how to implement it is um you know the agencies want to try and figure out how to do this in the least burdensome way possible and it's not just because they're nice people there's actually a law about reducing burden right there there's right so there there's a there's there's a set of laws that we operated under nsf that if we wanted to promulgate any regulation we had to show the office of management and budget we had to show other folks in government that we were doing this in the least burdensome way possible and so so much of what the subcommittee on open science was doing was trying to figure out ways to do this. And here's one thing that's possible. Uh, anybody who's dealt with multiple federal agencies knows that they have very different rules. So what if this thing were to come about, but you had like a single set of rules or a single set of expectations where you could, like let, let's say, you know, you had to put a data set on a public site, you could press a button and do it and it would work for any agency. That was a type of outcome we were really working towards. And that's possible. Nick may also knows that before I went to NSF, I was the chairman of the board of the Center for Open Science. And there are a lot of folks out there that are communicating with government about incentives and infrastructure you can build to basically make doing open science plug and play. And so that makes that means improving the user interfaces on things like you know uh, archives and, and repositories and things of that nature. It means coming up with metadata standards where your data can kind of, if you not, don't know what that means, data can communicate with each other and connect. So there's a lot of interest in trying to reduce burden and ultimately make this so that it's a normal part of a workflow. And five years from now, it's like, uh, we're all doing it. It's part of what science is. It's not actually that harder. And if we get this right, maybe it's even easier than a lot of the stuff we're doing now. Awesome, thank you. And Skip, we're gonna switch to Laura, but I don't know if you if you can um, stay on with your camera off, then we may come back if we have time to do some some questions for both of you. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thanks. So our next speaker is Laura Scott, who is a research professor in the Department of Biostatistics in the School of Public Health. Uh, the goal of Dr. Scott's work is to understand the factors that regulate gene expression levels and influence the regulatory environment in disease-related tissues. Uh, she leads studies to identify genetic variants that increase the risk of common diseases, including type 2 diabetes, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia, with an emphasis on African-American populations and a long-term study of 20,000 individuals in Finland, which I think we'll probably hear a little bit about. Um, through her scholarship, she works with incredibly large and diverse data sets and has sort of been walking the walk on uh, managing, sharing, st stewarding research data. Um, so we're thrilled to have her join us today. Uh, let's see, Laura, can you, there we go. There you are. And um, I will hand it over to you. Thanks very much. Sorry, just gonna that's stop sharing for a second. That's all right. I will try again. All right, let's go back. All right, let's try again here. Okay. Okay, welcome everyone. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a feel of how the things um, that were talked about by the last speaker actually play out in specific types of data and in specific um, genetic association data. So I do genetic association studies and in these studies, one way to think about them is that we compare 
um, people who might have a disease like type 2 diabetes, people who don't. Um, and specifically, we're interested in comparing their genotype frequencies. So at every base pair, you, you can have two different alleles in the simplest case. And what we want to know is do people have different frequencies of the different alleles if you have a disease and if you don't. So why do we do these studies? We do them to identify people at higher risk of a disease and to identify genes whose products, RNA or proteins, could be modified in some way to prevent disease. So the sharing of results and data um, from these studies um, for uh, uh, people um, kind of with a study and with resources allows people to identify more genetic associations um, than they could on their own. For people who don't have a study, um, so, so have no data, um, it allows them to try out new methods and to test new hypotheses. So I want to give you a sense of the data because I think it's useful for how people think about this in the past. So in the beginning of genetic association study, there were fiefdoms. So everybody had their own data sets. Each circle here is a study sample. And researchers um, were testing for um, association of one or a few genetic variants association with disease. And out of this, they published hundreds and thousands of papers identifying genetic variants um, associated with disease. But it turns out from subsequent work that we know that almost all of these papers were wrong. And here the, the P's um, in red are those papers that, that identified variants that were truly associated with diabetes. So why was this? It was because many people were testing small samples. They were testing variants until they found one that reached a nominal significance and publishing on that. So there was a great need to have a better um, accounting for how many tests were done um, and bigger samples. So this became possible to test more variants when, when genome-wide association studies were developed. And here we could test hundreds of thousands of variants. We had to have a significance level that was um, consistent with this. So here in blue are studies that had genome-wide association studies. And people started to publish papers. But what happened at that significance level was that in people's individual studies, they actually couldn't find anything. And so people that wasn't already found. So people started to band together and share results. There was a lot of negotiation to share those results, but we started to find results that actually stood up to the test of time. So here in the circle, I'm showing a study, three studies who came together to publish results, to combine the results and to publish on type 2 diabetes. Over time, more and more studies have banded together in the sharing of results. So this is great. Um, because each study has its own expertise unique to their study. There's joint quality control. Um, but if you don't have a study, as, as the previous speaker talked about, it's hard to participate. It's not, it's not equitable. So another, um, another way that people have gone about this is to make a single large study um, that has harmonious, ideally harmonious collection protocols, harmonious QC, extensive documentation. Um, and an example of this is the UK Biobank. So it has 500K um, UK participants. Um, there has been, from the sheet I saw, um, at least 224 million pounds of funding through um, 2022. Uh, the, it's data that's regularly updated, and they have an enormous amount of data. They have genotype data, health outcomes, physical measurements, questionnaires, all collected with the thought of being consistent um, and shared. So what I want to talk to you about is kind of what are the advantages and what are the costs of, to, of doing this type of sharing. So I'm going to talk about the UK Biobank and then the fusion um, type 2 diabetes study, um, which I've been a part of. So for the UK Biobank to get access, um, you need to make an application, a material transfer agreement, and then there are fees um, to access the data. So at the tier three fees, as you see down here, 
um, it can run up to uh, 9,000 pounds. So different from the, the model of the, um, the, the, the United States government here for the access of this data. The outcome of all of this data sharing, um, so from a PubMed search, there are uh, 6,173 papers that have been published, a 24 I counted in Nature Science, um, over a thousand just in the last, um, the last year on hundreds of traits, diseases. This has provided a test bed for methods development. Um, and there are enough people that use it that there's lots of expertise scattered in different groups. So this is like the ideal situation um, for data sharing. And a real, I think, success story of how that works. So on the other hand, in our fusion and MetSim uh, data studies, we're on the data deposit side of this. So leading that charge on our end um, is uh, Heather Stringham, who works within our group. Um, and we have worked on depositing um, genome-wide association data, phenotype data, omics data from hundreds to thousands of individuals. And Heather's experience with depositing this data into NIH, and I would say not just hers, but, but anybody who has done this, um, is that it's a very intensive process. Um, so there are file formats specific to dbGaP. Um, there's extensive documentation required. Um, for one data set, it has taken up to six years um, after submission to have data released. Um, lots of back and forth and long waits. So they are working on the process of streamlining it um, with consultants uh, like Heather and others who have lots of um, experience. So the depositing side of the data um, can actually be, depending on the data that you have to deposit, uh, very time consuming, um, which translates into um, expensive. So some takeaways for data sharing. So data sharing can produce an outpouring of discoveries. Um, it brings equality of opportunities to researchers across the globe. Um, it takes a large amount of effort to deposit data. Um, can be very hard to assess the quality of the data deposited um, from working with this data, right? If you don't know what batch was genotyped together, how things were done, you actually are putting data in that can potentially be, I don't know whether dangerous is the right word, but difficult um, to analyze without um, introducing bias. Uh, and if you have many small studies, it takes an enormous amount of effort um, to get them and combine them. And so that means there still is a very high value actually in sharing results and combining data at the results level across studies. Um, some issues uh, somewhat specific to genetic and biomedical data, you need to assure the protection of human subjects data, you need a regulatory structure to do that. Um, and then someone has to pay for the long-term storage of these really huge data sets. Um, so what might, may, what might the university do to make this easier for researchers? Um, so they could have dedicated consultants for data deposit to major databases, um, could offer services to convert files from standard formers, formats to dbGaP or whatever you're, um, whatever you're depositing to, uh, provide advice on budgeting um, in grant proposals. They could potentially provide one-time um, help to researchers who've run out of resources who just didn't realize how big of a, a thing this would be, um, and to have you know, a listserv that provides updates on the requirements and the resources to help with data deposits. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. That was really interesting. Um, and I'm sure there are going to be some questions too. In fact, um, we'll, let's try this feature out here. Um, looks like Jim Kenyon has raised his hand. I'm going to see if I can allow him to talk or if someone else can. Jim, are you there? Let's see. Allow to talk. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Oh, yep. Go ahead. So the data intake process, uh, that is, taking somebody else's uncurated junk. And I'm sure nobody thinks of their data as junk, but it is not a unheard of topic. Uh, we've been working with ICPSR a bit 
and they make a business out of taking collaborators data and curating it. It's, it's a librarian function. We have maybe as the world has digitized, kind of forgotten that librarians are really important people because what you've just outlined is a big librarian function. Uh, have you all started working with folks like the ICPSR folks on how they do that data curation process? Because they do it quite nicely. It is incredibly tedious, but they, they have a process for things like, how do I document this? How do I take care to make sure that things that shouldn't be released like biomedical data is properly treated or CUI is properly treated? How do I take care of paying for ongoing storage of large data sets? Um, these kinds of things that they have addressed. Uh, this ground has been plowed elsewhere on campus. Uh, just in case you all didn't know that they had been doing this, they have been at some scale and for a long, long, long time since what the fifties, maybe earlier. Yeah, yeah. I I think I just looked up. They were founded in maybe sixty two or something like that. ICPSR. Yeah. Um, so that's it. Th thank you, Jim. I don't know, Laura, if if you wanted to address any of those points, I can also maybe follow up after. So I haven't actually heard of icpr so i'm actually my mother is a librarian so i i, I have a great appreciation um for that um and would be really curious because i i think that it is wonderful right that people have to deposit data i know that there is um a huge amount of expertise in individual data sets that each set of researchers have to kind of know hopefully, if they've been careful enough where the problems are in their data, or if they haven't been, to just be completely oblivious to it. And the question really in my mind is, how would you build a system that was smart enough without, I mean, hundreds of hand hours of people um, and without necessarily the batch effects, because those really cause problems sometimes to data where you've spent millions of dollars to generate it. Um, and you don't wouldn't want anybody else to use that data because you yourself might <laughs> have been involved in one study, right? You yourself might not want to um, use that data. So how do we, it's like a rating, how do we, how do we rate data? How do we help people not make mistakes with data that either needs incredible care um, or perhaps should not be analyzed at all. And I, I, if there was a way to do that, if librarians could come up with a way to do that, that would be great. That's a good point. Someone made the joke recently I heard where no one pays for sawdust and, and the, the data that you're producing that um, doesn't end up being useful is a sort of entirely different uh, challenge associated with things that you wanna be using in a publication or releasing to the public for various reasons, uh, whether it's you've generated it through a computation or something else. Um, to, to Jim's point about the libraries in particular um, and the services they provide, I, I absolutely 100% agree with you. Um, and in fact, yes, you're right. There are, there are many people on campus that provide services for helping folks navigate these often muddy waters. Um, I mean, there are folks in, in Laura's world that are specialists in certain data sets and that, um, you know, that help people working on clinical trials or working on these big genome-wide association studies um, that, that they're technicians or their their research staff or something like that. But uh, the librarians have a lot more generalists that that still um, provide services. They have a, they have a data repository um, that we run called Deep Blue. And... Um, I didn't really talk about the, the 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 larger research data stewardship initiative much at all at the beginning, but that is a uh, from the beginning partnership with the libraries, and so they have been involved every step of the way in the formation of this initiative and in building the resources and tools that we're um, sort of aggregating together. Um, so I'll show a little bit about that after the Q and A here, 
um, but there are a lot of places that folks can go to get them um, help they need. That there is a bit of a difference between, I think, maybe the scale uh, issue. And if someone like Laura comes in and says, I have um, you know, decades of years of data and terabytes or, or whatever, petabytes, um, of, then, then that's a slightly different issue than, so I would say the majority of PIs or labs that are working on um, smaller data sets. And, um, but I think they stand ready um, and willing to, to jump in. And actually, um, I see we have a question from um, some folks from the library. Lori um, Tisher Hart, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher your name, Lori. Um, your question is, what does an ideal data deposit service look like? Um, it's very iterative. So how can we refine our services to maximize efficiency and success? I don't know if, Laura, if you were dreaming up your ideal service, um, at least a scalable service, what would it look like? So so from talking with Heather, I know that one of the issues has been there are standard formats of data that people store them in. Um, and sometimes the intake formats are not the same. So you spend your time translating this data into very specific formats. So it would be something that that had some flexibility was built. I, there's there's this tension right between and I know this from doing working on developing pro like web programs, right? You want everybody to give you their data in the same way and the way you like, and that takes a lot of work to do. And so I think somehow there would be um, more flexibility in taking data in. There would be in the case of dbGaP specifically, they are underfunded and understaffed. So there would be really high level. Um, quick, quick turnaround, because every day, every month that goes on, you lose expertise, right? You lose where was I, what was the issue, right? And when this drags out over time, you actually lose knowledge. And so there would be a, there would be enough funding and enough people there that you send an email, there's a problem, somebody gets back to you that day, you send another email. So instead of it taking months, it takes literally days to resolve issues. The other issue is that the types of data that we're generating keep changing. Now, some of it has somewhat similar format, but but the wonderful thing right about our work is that we keep expanding into spatial data, you know, and other types of data. So is there like a team in this resource, whatever it is, that's kind of running out front right and thinking and consulting with people even the formats that data get stored in traditionally change as better things come along um so they would be a very nimble very well staffed very scientifically competent hopefully very well paid um set of people who who really had this as a high priority i think that would be incredibly expensive right to make something that was that responsive but when it takes so long to get data into something you have lost the value of the initiative because there are data sets especially small small high like new technology ones that there is like a data sets have a half-life right and you're small and you're new and you are just incredibly valuable and then other people come along and you lose your value so there's a moment <laughs> which i think right, the government realizes of optimal usage, but for that to happen, you've got to be fast and you've got to be nimble. That's a great point. And actually, um, Jim, who raised the question earlier, just sent me a note and said, people do buy sawdust for certain things, actually. So sometimes you don't actually know when things are going to have value, um, which is why it's important from the beginning to, to make sure these processes and pipelines are sort of built uh, the right way from the beginning. Um, and then also, I just wanted to clarify, because I talked about the libraries, but Jim had also mentioned ICPSR, um, which is, I think, the, the oldest and biggest social science data repository in the world, uh, which sits at U of M. And Skip, um, Skip also has an ISR appointment and probably um, intimately familiar with ICPSR. Maggie Levenstein is the director, um, and she's actually in uh, as a, coming in as a speaker uh, next month in this seminar series too. So I'm very excited to have her join us. 
Um, and actually, Skip, this might be a good time because I think um, Alexa Pierce is on, I feel a bit like a radio host. Um, but Alexa asked a question in the chat and I asked her if she wouldn't mind um, saying it out loud because it might connect a little bit to both of you. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so the uh, uh, yes about ICPSR and I'll just to add to that, in a recent conversation with Kate Cagney, who is leading ISR, I was so honored. I'm, I'm appointed in the library, and she mentioned that she always thinks of their resources as a library, and I appreciated that, so um, for what it's worth. But the, the thing I was thinking about um, that I've been thinking about a lot, really, with OSTP is uh, there are a lot of opportunities, and one of them is just thinking more about how we help people connect all the outputs from their research, you know? So as we're shifting toward thinking, it's the it's the research that's funded and then the outputs that come from it, we wanna create access to, how can we also knit those together more effectively and earlier, but then also over time. And I think this is where thinking across disciplines matters because in some fields, people might publish once from a study and then they're done. And in other fields, probably more humanistic social sciences and humanities, you might publish for a long time, um, for several years from one study. And we wanna build up that kind of um, tissue or infrastructure to, to connect things. And I think the, the desirable characteristics speak to this a little bit, um, but there's probably room for more attention and investment there. Thank you. Nick, do you want me to address that a little bit? Yeah, either. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I will say um, when the government was putting together the policies, both to inform the National Secure Data Service and the open science practices, we did about a year of listening sessions. And uh, we, we had different groups and, and librarians were a huge part of that because, uh, you know, data librarians are on the vanguard of so many, you know, so many of the issues now about how you curate and how you manage and things of that nature. So just we're talking about the role of librarians. They were huge in that field. In terms of the connectivity, I may have gone through it too fast in the presentation, but the metadata standards that are in the new policy and the requirement for digital object identifiers really on everything every person, every patent, every data set, every grant, every contact. It's an attempt to try and form a common language. Uh, uh, so, you know, the dream that we had, we would sit, we would sit in offices and build, you know, what we want research.gov or whatever it's going to be called 10 years from now to be. And what we wanted was for you to be able to find anything from anything. So if you had a fragment of knowledge, a fragment of exposure, and you wanted to find the other people that were involved, there are the other data sets that were like this, or the other things, what, you know, what was disagreeing with it or whatever, you could find it. And so the key invest, I mean, none of that's possible from a programming perspective, unless you have a common language and we really don't right now. So, you know, you wouldn't believe the, the, the how long you can have arguments about metadata standards. And, and that sounds like nothing, but if, if we can't get a common language, we just can't build up. And the DOI, again, maybe it's every in that memo, everybody talked, oh, zero embargoes, this is so important. And it's really important, but having DOIs on everything is essential to findability, right? And so I think those are the types of things uh, that they're really, that folks are really investing in. Now, I'll tell you the bad news. You still need places to store stuff. And there are some really, really hard um, ethical questions about what you keep. And just for those who are just coming in the conversation, you cannot keep everything. Uh, you just cannot do it. Like there's even no projection of Moore's law where you can, because because there's some super Moore's law, where we're just creating way more than we can store like in the next generation. So there's some very big decisions to make. And I can't say that we, we resolve those, but those are huge. Thanks, Skip. L Laura, do you want to talk about the connectivity issue and, and maybe like how, because the, the UK Biobank seems like a good example of where maybe that's, they've started to figure that out a little bit more and how have practices evolved over time? So I can only speak, you know, from our, um, from our perspective of, we have, we have, so <laughs> the, what, what a, what a, so at the level of a sample, right, which is really the piece that connects things in our world, right? You have a study ID. Um, the issue is that when samples go other places, people give them other study IDs. 
and keeping track of which study IDs go together and mean what um, can sometimes be challenging. And even in our world, we may think that we genotype somebody with one study ID, but it actually was a different person. And so there is a lot of cleaning, right, that goes on to make sure that we've got the correct people assigned, you know, to the correct identifiers. And studies handle that differently. Um, in TopMed, I think they give each each somehow sample a name, and then they have a they have a big chart that matches people together. So you never change the ID that you've given something, but you you have a table that you update. And that seems like a, a better way than going in and trying to change the name. So I think it's, I think hopefully that happens more on the study level and then somehow you, you submit something. But I don't know what happens if after the fact you realize when you've done data by something else, you know, that these two actually didn't match. You know, and how then in repositories do you submit a new thing? Um, it's a smaller level, but there's also like time scale. So making sure you have indicators of what time you got it. Um, and I think the UK Biobank, I don't know how they do it, but I'm sure they have put lots and lots and lots of money into that process. And individual studies do struggle because things are not always what they appear to be. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. And I don't know, Skip, if you had anything else to follow up. Um, but I, we are almost right at time. So I think we have one or two more questions we weren't able to get to, and I apologize for that. Um, so I, I would like to wrap this up by saying thank you so much to Laura and to Skip for joining us today uh, for that great conversation. This is, this is being recorded, and so it'll be available online if you want to uh, refer back to it later or share it with some of your colleagues. And um, as a reminder, we have two more of these this fall coming up. It's the first Friday of the month. Um, as I mentioned before, Maggie Levenstein from ICPSR is joining us next month, along with Ricky Punzalan from the School of Information. And then in December, we have John Allison from Engineering and Kate Spector Baghdadi from the Medical School um, speaking. So it's a it's a great lineup. Uh, I had a lot of fun today. The the next few um, will be equally interesting. And um, I will just end by sharing a, a link um, to our research data stewardship website where we've pulled together a lot of the resources that were sort of mentioned uh, throughout today. Um, and I think also now that we've we've heard more and had this conversation, we'll, we'll get to work on identifying even more resources and, and looking at how we can better serve uh, the research community here at Michigan. So thank you all so much for joining us and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks.